Hello, good morning, Ms. Viewers. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Robert Farley from the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. Um, and joining us today is Pete Mansour. Um, first, how are you doing, Pete? And would you uh, would you mind introducing yourself um, to our accumulated viewers? Uh, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm Dr. Pete Mansour. I teach at the Ohio State University. I hold the Raymond D. Mason Jr. Chair of Military History here. And I assumed that position uh, roughly four and a half years ago after a 26-year career in the Army, which included two tours in, in Iraq. Right. And you also uh, wrote the, the fabulous book, Baghdad at Sunrise, um, which was one of the... Author of uh, Baghdad at Sunrise, Brigade Commander's War in Iraq, which is my first book on the Iraq War. I have a forthcoming book uh, this fall from Yale University Press entitled Surge, My Journey with General David Petraeus and the Remaking of the Iraq War. I was his executive officer during the surge. And I'm also author of the GI Offensive in Europe, the Triumph of American Infantry Divisions, 1941 to 1945. Um, so today we are going to be talking about um, a work that you co-edited with uh, Williamson Murray um, titled Hybrid War. Um, and I, I don't recollect the, the subtitle. You, you have a copy of the book, so you can show it up for the people. I do. I will see if I can get it in the screen here. There it is. Nice photo, uh, cover photo from the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, so I, th I want to start by asking sort of, you know, what, uh, so why now for a book about hybrid war? How do you conceive of hybrid war? Um, and then I want to get into some of the more interesting, I mean, they're all kind of interesting, but some of the, the, the chapters that were most interesting to me. So I guess to start with now, um, you know, what was the genesis of the project um, and how are you guys approaching the question of hybrid war? Right. Well, roughly seven years ago, uh, certain analysts in Washington, D.C. were positing a supposedly new type of war, which they termed hybrid war, uh, the combining of irregular and conventional forces, the melding of high technology with sort of guerrilla stealth and tactics. Um, Frank Hoffman was one of the uh, leading proponents of this concept. Max Boot, in uh, one of his works, uh, also discussed it. And... Um, Dr. Williamson Murray, my colleague, and I uh, decided uh, to take a, a deeper historical look at this because we didn't feel that this was a new type of war at all. And uh, so that was the genesis of the project. I got a, a, a nice grant from the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. And in 2010, we held a conference at the Mershon Center with our chapter authors and, and discussed uh, their, their findings and then uh, turned it into a book. In our view, uh, hybrid warfare is the melding of conventional and irregular forces in symmetric or asymmetric combat, and this could include state and non-state actors, uh, to achieve a common political goal. And it's this common political goal that really drives the, the hybrid aspect uh, and, and the melding of the conventional and irregular rather than any sort of um, common command and control. Sometimes there is some sort of loose control of the guerrillas, and other times there is not, but it really doesn't matter. It's more that they're all fighting on the same team for the same purpose. Right. Well, and that and that same team for same purpose can be, even that can be fairly broadly defined in some cases, right? Uh, so, I mean, we would, you know, we would still consider it, um, so say, and you guys don't do a chapter on this, but people talk about it sometimes, uh, the, the uh, experience of the Yugoslavs, uh, against the Germans in the 1940s, right, where you had a variety of different guerrilla organizations that did kind of share a political goal in terms of expelling the Germans, but that um, that sort of had very different visions of what the eventual Yugoslavia would, would, would look like. Yeah, certainly, and, and that war only became hybrid, though, in 1945 when you had a Soviet conventional army that approached Yugoslavia. Right. Otherwise, it's just a guerrilla conflict, right. which is not what we're necessarily interested right. in. Now, just to recollect back on the, the Hoffman work and so forth, now how did, did, did sort of this new wave of thinking about hybrid war, if we want to categorize it as such, did it, and I'm having trouble remembering myself, did it come before or after the, uh, the Israeli Hezbollah war, um, or was this sort of all emerging around uh, the same time? Almost at the same, it was at the same time. I think Frank and, and others looked at what happened in Lebanon and said, wow, this is really something different. Uh, Hezbollah with these conventional type capabilities, uh, cruise missiles, uh, 
rockets, anti-tank missiles, and they look like a conventional force, but they're not. And he said, this must be something new. You know, I love the I love his writings. I, I think he's done a great service to the profession to bring this up, but I, I just don't think necessarily this is, that this is new and, and thus, thus our work. Right, right. Right, although, you know, I, I suppose that, I mean, maybe if you ask Frank, he, would, he might make the argument that, you know, we know, or at least I understand it's not new, but, right, at the time, people were sort of trying to make this stark division between counterinsurgency and um, conventional warfare, right? And so I was trying to, maybe he was trying to refine a space between that. Um, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. Right, and, and I agree with him in that regard. Right. Um, we, we're in violent agreement that the future of warfare is going to be this blending of, uh, of conventional and irregular uh, force. Well, I mean, so much for the future of warfare for now, although I want to, we'll come back to that, but um, sort of what guided your um, case selection? I mean, it's a, for me, reading it, there were three particularly exciting or particularly interesting chapters, um, which were the Germany case, the, um, uh, the uh, Civil War case in the United States, and had the, um, the uh, Japanese and China case. Um, I mean, so when you approach this, um, how did you think about case selection uh, for the book and which, which, which wars you would include and which ones you wouldn't? So we wanted uh, wars from every era. Uh, we wanted one in the ancient world. We, um, we actually wanted one in the medieval world, didn't find one, uh, or actually didn't find an author to do one. Uh, and we had one in early modern Europe, and then uh, they become more prevalent uh, as we get past the 18th century. Um, for the ancient world, we actually were, wanted to do a case study of the uh, Peloponnesian War because the Spartans were facing a, a hybrid threat with the um, Athenian army and navy, the conventional threat, and then the, the threat of a hell up uprising in Lacedonia in their home base, which would, would have been the uh, guerrilla threat, which the Athenians actually took advantage of at, at Pylos and Sacraria. So, uh, but we didn't get an author for that. We did um, uh, get Jim Lacey to write a, a really excellent chapter on the, uh, the Roman incursion into uh, Germania and the Battle of the Teutoburger Forest in 9 AD, and then the, uh, the resulting Ro Roman punitive raids and retaliation. And we thought it was a very instructive uh, chapter, and uh, he did a great job. Right. No, it, it, I, I thought he did a fantastic job because he, um, he sort of gave a compelling explanation for why the Roman armies fighting in Gaul had it so much differently than how they were fighting in Germany. You know, Caesar conquers Gaul in a relatively straightforward fashion in, in the first century BC. It's obviously not the first interaction between the Romans and the Gauls, but um, and then there seems to be at least some expectation among the Roman elite that there will be a similar set of campaigns uh, against the Germans, right? That, that the Germans will be able to be, able to be brought into the empire um, in, in a similar fashion to the Gauls, and you know what? What they find obviously is that the um, the Germans simply won't stand up and fight in the same way that the Gauls will, right? That, that and I think part of the point was um, that the infrastructure in Gaul was so much better that um, there was a different structure of sort of communal and individual property rights, such that um, people were willing to people were forced to stop or to set up and actually fight to defend, you know, what they viewed as their property in a way that they they had a different understanding in Germania. Um, and so you had this uh, endless situation where the, the Romans were trying to sort through these various tribes and make alliances and control the territory through the tribes um, and sort of were unable to bring um, the German forces to decisive battle under, um, under terms that they wanted to find a decisive battle. And of course... Well, I think that's exactly uh, right. There's a, there's a great map in the book that uh, shows uh, Germania and shows all the different tribes there, and there's dozens, uh, and it's very, very difficult culturally for the Romans. Uh, it's an enemy that, that isn't going to fight, like Vercingetorix, for instance. Um, they, uh, Germany is a terrible place in those days, heavily forested, uh, very poor lines of communication, and most of the lines of communication run north-south, not east-west. So the German army, once it advances beyond the Rhine, has a real difficult time moving 
and uh, employing the type of combat that it's used to. Uh, and uh, the uh, Germans took advantage of that. Their, their, uh, their leader, Arminius, was trained in Roman combat. Um, he used his, uh, the various tribes to peck, at, peck away at the Roman lines of communication, and then when the time was right, he massed his force in the Teutoburg Revolt and descended on the Roman, four Roman legions and, and wiped them right. out. And it was also interesting because you see patterns that emerge in later hybrid conflict, right, where sort of even, you know, even, even when the Roman legions are, are sort of an extremist, but where they're, they are um, in extremely bad situations, you would still get, and, but yet they were able to form up and then they were able to repulse the German assault, right? So you got a sense of the advantages, not only in the unconventional styles of warfare that the Germans were launching, but also, you also get some real understanding of how powerful the Roman legions were when they were fighting um, in the style that they preferred, right? That, that um, they were still able right. to defeat um, the Germans, even you know, almost to the last, when the Germans attack them in conventional means. The Germans are, uh, could never really overrun a, a well-designed and, and constructed Roman base. And this is what the Romans sort of counted on. They'd build these base camps, have tribes impale themselves on these base camps, and then they'd wipe them out. Arminius didn't play their game. He waited until they were strung out on a route of march and descended on them in a very constricted terrain, and that's how they gained their victory. Um, and then even when the Romans were able to form up, they still had to move eventually to get back to the Rhine, and, uh, and that made them vulnerable. Right, and, and we, should, we should hesitate to, uh, to add, of course, that Arminius did not have a happy ending either, right? I mean, to my recollection, he was assassinated right. a few years later by, by... I don't think anyone in the ancient world right. had a really happy ending. <laughs> it was a pretty brutal time. Right. Oh, I don't, you know, the, the, for, for a while there was a Roman elite in Rome that you know, mostly died in its beds, uh, you know, more or less. I guess a few, few of the emperors, anyway. Um, so, I mean, I guess w before we leave the Germans, uh, th there's one last point, because uh, so, uh, many of the historians of the empire, or I don't know how current this is, but there it used to be a common argument that had the Romans been able to push all the way to the Alb, and had they been able to Romanize um, Germania, that it would have significantly shortened the defensive lines, um, and it would have paid off significant dividends later, sort of centuries later in the empire. Um, Lacey seems pretty skeptical of that, I think, because he was pretty skeptical that they were ever going to be able to dominate this area in any vaguely economical fashion, right? Because there was no money there. There was no, there was very little trade, very little gold. Um, there was nothing to get out of this province that could possibly get the investment back. No. It wouldn't have paid for itself, for right. sure, and I'm not sure the, short, the, 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 the shortening of the lines really would have guarded the Romans uh, some sort of efficiencies right. in scale. I, I think the Rhine was a natural barrier. Uh, it was a good waterway for communication, and, and I think uh, that they were right to, to stay there. I think the other thing we could discuss is the Roman reaction to Arminius and uh, the Battle of the Teutoburger Wald was to go in for eight years and raid uh, Germany, suppress the tribes, quote, teach them a lesson, and then leave. Right. And the lessons uh, that that may suggest for the United States today, uh, oh, say, in, in reacting to bin Laden's terrorism, terrorist attack on 9-11 and, and what we could have done in Afghanistan versus what we did do. Right. There was no, there was no effort to, um, I mean, there certainly the Romans made an effort to develop partners, right? Um, but there was no effort um, that's anything anywhere analogous to the construction of state institutions. Right. I mean, they didn't try to erect. Yeah, they were not into nation building in Germania, uh, nor were they into counterinsurgency. It was a punitive raid. We'll find what allies we can, and then we'll we'll get back to the Rhine and call it a day. Right, right, and and and, and of course, you know, it also involved the, the utter butchery of, of many of the villages that they found when they did find them in Germany. So, um, so I mean, moving on from the Germans, another chapter. I mean. It would, Americans, I think, too often conceive of the American Civil War as, as a straightforward conventional conflict between the armies of, of Lee and whoever is the Union commander at the time. Um, but, uh, and I don't recollect the author of the Civil War chapter off the top of my head. But anyway, Daniel Sutherland, Daniel Sutherland from the University of Arkansas. Right. Um, 
makes the argument that the, the campaign was much more irregular um, or much more hybrid um, than, is, than, is commonly, than is commonly argued. Um, and so, uh, I mean, can we talk a little bit about that? What's on either side? What were the hybrid aspects of the of the American Civil War? Sure, I think the interesting thing that uh, Daniel Sutherland points out is that both sides used hybrid warfare in the Civil War. The, uh, the South had their guerrilla bands, Morgan's Raiders being one of the more famous ones, and uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest as well. And then they used these to attack Union supply lines while their main forces were engaged with the Union armies. On the Union side, it was sort of hybrid warfare by default. They had conventional forces, but because of the threat of slave uprisings, the South was forced to keep some military power at home uh, for fear that uh, they'd have some sort of conflict in their rear. And there would be occasional uh, cavalry raids, like Grusin's raid um, uh, through Mississippi. So there were um, there are hybrid aspects on both sides, which I think uh, Sutherland points out. Right. Well, and it's also, I think that, that people who are, who, who not necessarily, you will sometimes see the argument, why did the South not pursue a, a, um, a complete full tilt um, insurgency strategy? Um, and there are obvious answers to that question, right? You know, one, you have the problem of slavery that, if you pursue a full insurgency strategy, you can't police your own territory. You know, two wealthy landowners tend to not to prefer <laughs> insurgency strategies. Um, and there's some explanation for why the South is pursuing um, this, um, you know, why it decides to go as conventional as it does, um, given the disadvantages that it had against the North. Um, you know, it's also worth noting, I believe he mentions this, that there were, um, there were um, white guerrilla uprisings in the South. Um, in certain places like East Tennessee and in East Tennessee, Western yeah. Carolina, where conventional Confederate forces yeah, were afraid to go. The, um, the other thing about the Civil War, which is not actually in Sutherland's chapter, but is in Williamson Murray's uh, conclusion, is that it's one of the few examples where, uh, where the uh, side that, that is hybrid warfare is being used against actually wins. Uh, the South uh, um, arguably has more of a hybrid strategy with its guerrilla raiders and its conventional forces, and yet it loses. But, but the, the major conclusion here is just how difficult, how long, how nasty, how bloody uh, these types of wars are, and then the after effects, which really is a hundred years of conflict in the South um, until uh, the civil rights uh, movement in the 1960s. Uh, so hybrid warfare actually often changes entire societies and affects them in ways that are pretty fundamental. Right. I mean, I, and I wish I had the book. I wish I had the book um, uh, handy right now. It's probably on one of my shelves, but I'm sure that you, like me, can never find the right book at the right time. Um, but there's a, a lot of interesting recent work on sort of the continuation of hybrid warfare in the South after the end of the war, right, all the way up until the end of Reconstruction. Um, and I, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, the book is about the governor of Mississippi, sort of the last Northern Union governor of Mississippi, um, and how he effectively had to wage uh, against a, a series of hybrid enemies along the, the Mississippi-Louisiana border until the North just gave up. But well, it's, it's a good point, and, and my colleague at Ohio State, uh, Mark Grimsley, has written about how the uh, civil rights movement is actually an ins could be construed as an insurgency uh, against southern states right. until it succeeds in the 1960s. So, very interesting uh, the hybrid aspects of this conflict, and it doesn't end in 1865. Right. Um, one of the, for me, the single most interesting chapter of the book was the one by uh, Lieutenant General, or retired Lieutenant General, uh, uh, Noburo Yamaguchi. Noburo Yamaguchi. Um, uh, writing about the Japanese experience in China um, in uh, uh, World War II, right, and, or the Sino-Japanese War, more broadly written. The Second Sino-Japanese War, right. right. Um, now, I think that you, like me, probably had the fairly common understanding of this war, which was that the Japanese just simply employed a set of horrific, brutal tactics against the Chinese, and, you know, largely undifferentiated 
brutal, horrific tactics across the war. Um, and that picture isn't entirely wrong, but it's also not right. Um, I mean, Yamaguchi gives a much more complex yeah. understanding. It is. When I read his chapter, the draft of it, I said, wow, this parts of this sound not much different from our doctrine. Right. Uh, they were talking about uh, reaching out to, to Chinese uh, peasants and to bring them on your side and sort of um, a nation, sort of semi nation building aspects, civil affairs for right. sure. Well, I mean, there was, there was, was like I didn't even know there were elements of this right. in the Japanese army. There was, there was, I mean, there was a quote that I lifted out for some blog post that I wrote, um, which was along the lines of somebody, somebody making the argument that as long as we don't have security, we we can't build up the local economy, and the the villagers have no reason to appreciate the Japanese, right? And which is which is straightforward best practices, modern counterinsurgency theory, right? And you would never expect it to find and find it in this place. No, I was expecting to find doctrine of kill them all and sort them out later, right. and, and then they will calm them into submission. And, and at least in their in their writings, they didn't talk about that. And this is a, this is a case study in the North China area. It might have been different in the coastal areas or somewhere else. Right. So there were a couple other things about that chapter that struck me, uh, which I'll talk about. One is I thought that the primary enemy for the Japanese Army in World War II was first uh, China, uh, then the United States and the Pacific Islands, then maybe Burma, and, and then a distant fourth, the Soviet Union. And uh, it becomes very clear to me in reading Yamaguchi's chapter that the Soviet Union is considered the number one threat to Japan by the Army. And it keeps its best trained forces along the uh, border with, in Manchuria, the northern border. Uh, it's constantly training uh, forces for high-end warfare because it, it's afraid of suffering another defeat at the hands of the mechanized Red Army like they uh, suffered at Nomenhan in 1939. Uh, and it, it bifurcates or actually trifurcates the, the Japanese army in China, which is forced to fight the, 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 ja the Chinese, train forces for high-end mechanized warfare against the Soviets, and train forces for jungle fighting and island fighting in the Pacific. And it just can't do it all. Uh, it doesn't have enough forces, and there's only so many hours in a day. And so it does everything uh, actually rather poorly. Right. The other thing that really struck me is there's a great map in there, which uh, 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 maps out where all the Japanese forces were in northern China uh, in, the, in the World War II time frame. And if you look at all the cities and all the rail lines, the, all the Japanese forces are in the cities and along the rail lines, and uh, presumably the roads that run along the rails. And in between, well, there be monsters, <laughs> right. or in more specifically, there be Miles gorillas. And you, you just you get a sense that this was a bridge too far for the Japanese army. Uh, they could not fight a counterinsurgency and mass forces for against the nationalist uh, army at the same time. Right, which is, which is in the end, as you suggest, why, um, even though they had, uh, there was much, con much, much conversation and discussion um, about appropriate means towards the Chinese, that the, the, our picture that has come down of actual Japanese behavior is not at all, not terribly inaccurate, right? Um, it, it was also interesting because he talked about, you know, again, we sort of think about the, the United States as the only country burdened by um, the... Uh, the perils of interagency process, right? But um, it, it really came through here, right, that you had all of these agencies in the Japanese government contending over strategy and policy in China um, and their bureaucratic turf battles and, you know, everything else happening beyond even sort of the greater problems of, of how do we deal with the Chinese Soviet threat. And in Japan with the added threat that if I don't like your position, you may end up being assassinated. Right. The, the Japanese government is very dysfunctional in the 30s and 40s, and uh, that comes through pretty clearly. Right, right, and it also it also comes through in through the invasions in Southeast Asia when there was there was considerable money on the table for the Japanese that they just sort of left there um, because of their their fairly horrific occupation practices. Right, that there was a lot of sympathy. Yeah, this is both the Japanese and the Germans. Um, had they not been Japanese and Germans, they could have gone in 
uh, to many of these uh, nations, portrayed themselves as liberators, and gotten uh, substantial help from the locals, the Germans in Ukraine for sure, and the uh, Japanese in Indonesia, and, and uh, many of the former British colonies. And yet, because of their uh, really uh, horrific type of occupation authorities, uh, they turn the people against them, and you end up with massive uh, guerrilla campaigns in some of these places, the most prominent being in the Philippines, where the, it's a hybrid conflict. We didn't, add, we didn't include it uh, in the book, but it's an excellent example of hybrid warfare. When the U.S. invades the Philippines in 1944 and 45, there's a, a massive uh, guerrilla infrastructure that helps out uh, against the Japanese and helps the U.S. Army and, uh, and it, it, our forces out. So, excellent, another excellent example of hybrid warfare there. Right, right. And I mean, there's a, I mean, there's so much sort of interesting in terms of the political purposes there too, right? I mean, because, you know, one of the reasons that um, Filipinos were willing to fight on the U.S. side is because there had been a, a very explicit process for independence, um, clear promises of when independence would come, uh, you know, efforts to construct a, um, uh, a, a robust democratic regime. Philippines, which, you know, didn't necessarily play out in the post-war era, although independence did. And, and a really benign colonial occupation right. um, that did help the Filipinos out in many ways, you know, medicine, sanitation, education, the economy. Right, I mean, after, after the, the first Filipinos, few years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, right. Uh, it was a, f but we're talking, the memories in 1944 are not of 1902, right. but really of the, maybe the 1930s. And, um, and they know that in 46, they're going to get their independence. So uh, all of my archival research suggests that the Americans go in and the Filipinos just cheer. Um, and there's, there's great support for the, the troops as they, as they attack the Japanese and clear them out of uh, the Philippines, and despite the horrific carnage in places like Manila. Right, right. And again, I mean, the Japanese don't help themselves by, by carrying out serial massacres of, of, of uh, population and so forth. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, one of the, I, I read a captured diary of a Japanese officer, which had been translated, <clears throat> and he talks about going into a village and literally wiping everyone in the village out. This was before the U.S. invaded. And he goes, today my sword is dripping with blood. I'm ashamed to be a Japanese officer. Um, I think that's pretty much says it all. Right. There's a uh, there's a book. Uh, oh, I, I do see it right now. A book called Forgotten Armies, which talks a little bit about. Uh, I don't know if you've read it, but it talks a little bit about um, Japanese occupation in Malaya and how one of the innovations that they came up with was uh, forcing the Muslims to pray to Tokyo instead of Mecca. Which, you know, in your own experience, you could probably see how that wouldn't work out. Um, never, <laughs> never a crowd pleaser. Right, <laughs> wouldn't work out in the long term. Um, so, you know, one of the interesting questions that develops in a survey like this um, that goes all the way from, you know, legion and, you know, manipular uh, phalanx-oriented fighting in uh, Germania to, um, and the final chapter you're doing here is Vietnam, and so you have sort of a very modern account of war, um, is the degree to which technology affects the fighting of hybrid war, right? Um, what about hybrid war does technology change? And, you know, parts of this question are obvious, right? I mean, people are using more sophisticated means of communication, more sophisticated weapons on either side. Um, but is there any way that technology is or has or can change sort of the fundamental nature of hybrid war, or does it just change as cost with which just the vocabulary um, that, that hybrid war has? Yeah, I think the latter. Um, now, Frank Hoffman argues that it's created a fundamentally new type of war. These highly uh, uh, technologically savvy and, and well-equipped guerrilla forces that can function both as guerrillas and as conventional forces, depending on what they want to do. You know, I'm not so sure, because if you go back to, say, the Boer War, the Boers had better technology than the British, arguably. They had Krupp cannons and... Um, and good rifles, and, and, and it, uh, so we've seen this in the past. Right. And really, the Boer War was a conventional uh, war followed by a, a guerrilla war, so it made, it made it a hybrid conflict. But, um, you know, however, however it is fought, war is war. And this is from, you know, a quote from Colin Gray, and uh, 
And he's right. And, and so I think we are going to be, we're going to see with the proliferation of technology and weapons around the world, the breaking down of uh, <clears throat> international barriers and globalization and so forth. Uh, insurgents, guerrillas, irregular forces, terrorists, they're all going to be better equipped. Uh, and we're going to have to deal with that. And it also means that uh, states like Iran may fashion some sort of a defensive posture that it, were we to invade, um, they would have conventional forces, but then they'd also have a lot of uh, irregular forces trying to to uh, get at our lines of supply right. and uh, our headquarters and, and terrorist bombings and so forth. So we're going to see this melding in the future, I think. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, in, in Iran's case, we, we already, I mean, we kind of have that already. Right? They have the conventional army and they have the Revolutionary Guard, which would be expected, I think, to operate uh, along those lines. Although there's also tension between those, right? I mean, one of the reasons you keep away around the Revolutionary Guard is because you don't trust the army. Right, and, and some of this, like in Spain, uh, some of it may be just, I, I'm not talking about Iran in particular, but um, you can think of some other countries around the world where were they to be invaded, there would be just popular um, uprisings and, and people joining guerrilla movements just to oppose the invader. This is what David Kilcullen writes about in his book, The Accidental Guerrilla, that by going into Afghanistan, we created guerrillas just because we're in the valley and, and you know, we're, we're outsiders. Um, so, moving on just a, just a touch from this, but I think, I think that, um, I think that what we've been talking about leads into this question. So, um, right now, I mean, literally right now, we are in the throes of debate over the sequester, or our argument over um, the sequester and how deeply um, the U.S. defense budget is going to be cut. Um, and at least... An argument that some people are making, and I think are making on the, especially on the air and the naval side, is that, you know, what fundamentally needs to happen is a refocus away from um, conventional army operations and even sort of hybrid preparedness, or, and but not only conventional army operations, but also counterinsurgency heavy, um, a counterinsurgency heavy army. Um, because, you know, these are not the wars we're going to be fighting, these are not the wars we want to fight, and so we should, instead of just cutting across the board, be more substantially cutting from the Army than from, um, and maybe to a lesser extent the Marine Corps, than we're cutting from the Navy and the Air Force. Um, you know, from a hybrid war perspective, but also from your own sort of personal perspective, how do you react to arguments like that? Well, the, you know, I think you said it. The wars we want to fight and the wars we have to fight are two different things. And the Army and uh, Marines, Navy, Air Force would all like to fight, uh, you know, their own version of, of, uh, of high-tech warfare once again. The Navy would love to refight the Battle of the Philippine Sea. <laughs> the Air Force would love to execute the bombing campaign over Germany. The Army would love the campaign in Northwest uh, Europe in 44. And, the Marines would like to uh, assault Iwo Jima again. I, I mean, you, you get what I'm right. saying. They, that's their vision of who they are, and no one wants to fight the messy, ugly, small wars. But unfortunately, that's probably what we're going to be faced with. Uh, now, you can say we're going to pivot to Asia and we're going to develop air-sea battle to be able to penetrate the anti-access, anti-denial capabilities of the Chinese, uh, to do what, I'm not sure, because there's no way we're going to invade China. Um, and fighting China, I think, uh, would be a, a huge mistake. They're our largest trading partner, for one thing. Uh, and, and developing these capabilities, unwittingly, we're painting China as an enemy when China doesn't necessarily have to be an enemy. But meanwhile, there are conflicts along the arc of instability uh, in the Middle East, South Asia, and North Africa that are going to rear their ugly heads, as they have recently in Mali. And those are the kind of wars that we're going to be faced with, and we don't necessarily have to fight them with uh, boots on the ground, but certainly uh, special forces, training teams, advisory missions, uh, air power, uh, th drones, those sorts of capabilities are going to be very, very useful. Um, and we never know. You can say, well, we don't want to fight a big conventional land war again. But we, we have been very terrible in our nation's history in actually predicting where the next war is going to be. 
And uh, these wars have a tendency to, to rear up in strange places and, and bite us. Um, you know, you can imagine any number of scenarios, Pakistan collapsing and nuclear weapons falling into the hands of uh, the Pakistani Taliban and all sorts of other nightmare scenarios that could require boots on the ground, even though we don't want to. Um, so, you know, this is this is would be my response. Uh, pivot to Asia, maybe, but uh, not so fast. Um, so what is your sense, as you suggested, this is not the only book on the subject of becoming out right now. I mean, you have another book coming out, and Max Booth just wrote, wrote his book, and Fred Kaplan just wrote his book, The Insurgents. Um, what is your sense of, you know, whether or not uh, the, the fence cuts come down you know, on the army or sort of more generally? What is your sense of how hybrid war is going to be, is going, what role is it going to play in how the army, and to an extent the Marine Corps, thinks of itself over the next 20 or 30 years? And, and you know, obviously I'm referencing here the way in which uh, you know, in some senses, the army is thought to have deliberately forgotten aspects of the Vietnam experience after Vietnam. Um, is there going to be, in your view, something similar to that um, over the next 20 years, or is there enough institutional buy-in that these capabilities are going to stick around? Well, as Chow and I famously said of the French Revolution, what he thought about it, too early to tell. Um, the army after uh, Vietnam rightly focused on the, the largest threat to U.S. Uh, national security, which was the Red Army in, in Europe. Uh, but having said that, it, it did jettison its lessons of the Vietnam conflict. Uh, Conrad Crane has written a, a wonderful little pamphlet called Forgetting Vietnam, in which he, he lays the, this out. Um, now, I don't think the Army necessarily did the wrong thing by fashioning doctrine and, and training its forces for high-end co conflict in Europe. What it did do wrong is not keep uh, the basis for counterinsurgency warfare, uh, at least in the professional military education system. Uh, it didn't train it. Um, there were maybe the occasional course at West Point or at the Command and General Staff College, which would be electives. Uh, but by and large, the Army Officer Corps was ignorant of counterinsurgency warfare, not even having uh, a familiar, familiarity with it you know, going into Iraq, and, and I think it, it um, you know, it, it was a disservice to the profession. So, in the future, the Army talks a good, good game right now about combining what they call wide area security with uh, aspects of conventional warfare, and that they're going to train both, but I'm dubious. There's only so many hours in the day, so many days in the year, and only so much money, and the money's going to get less, not more. Um, in the future. So my, my advice to the Army would be train for high-end combat because that's, that's the most difficult thing in terms of training your forces, not necessarily intellectually. Uh, but then educate your officers and to a lesser extent your non-commissioned officers in all types of combat so that if they're faced with another counterinsurgency, we haven't lost uh, that knowledge and those lessons that people can think through intellectually what's happening. And then you can retrain forces pretty quickly, which, which I saw this on the ground in uh, Iraq in 0304. And I think the uh, Army's authors of Certain Victory, uh, the second volume, uh, talk about this. That there was a lot of adaptation in Army units uh, and Marine units from uh, 03 to 06. The problem was it wasn't systematized uh, and there was no operational concept to guide it. And, and that's what the surge brought in, uh, in my view. Right. But um, you can, if you have forces trained for uh, high-end conventional warfare, you can retrain them for conventional warfare if you have an officer corps that's uh, educated and flexible. Right, and uh, we're gonna have that intellectual, comp that intellectual capital in the Army for quite a while, right? Because we're still going to have uh, an NCO corps and an officer corps that, that um, you know, continues to have a great deal of experience from Iraq, a great deal of experience from Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, to my, to my understanding, the narratives of Afghanistan and Iraq are not the same as the narrative of the war that came out of Vietnam. Right? That, that this was you know, a failure that everybody wants to kind of forget about and never talk about anymore. 
Um, and that's not the narrative that has emerged, or that within the service that has emerged from these two these two wars. Um, well, it's really interesting. In Iraq, there's competing narratives. Um, and on one side, there's uh, folks like uh, Tom Ricks and you know, Michael Gordon, I would include myself in this category, uh, Linda Robinson, uh, who say that the surge succeeded. Um, we can debate how much it succeeded and, and what the long-term effects are. Uh, but I think that the outcome in Iraq was much more favorable than seeing North Vietnamese tanks crash through the embassy gates in Hanoi. I'm sorry, in, in Saigon in 1975. Um, you know, Iraq, um, you know, the history, it's got a long way to go in terms of uh, the outcome of the war and what the final resolution will be. Uh, but I, I think uh, the surge did us a great service strategically and not just operationally and tactically, because if were Iraq to implode now, it would do so under far different strategic conditions than uh, existed in 2006 when the place was coming apart and the Middle East was about to explode. Um, Afghanistan is a little different story uh, because there will be no definitive uh, end, although there's still terrorism in Iraq, there really isn't an insurgency now. There is still going to be an insurgency in Afghanistan when we leave. And so I, I'm not quite sure how people are going to view that conflict, uh, win, lose, or tie. And uh, I think there is... Uh, less of a sense that what we achieve there is going to be lasting, but uh, right. we'll well, I mean, that. well, it, I read a just a, a fabulously interesting. It came out of Rand, and, uh, and, and I can't remember her name right now. Um, and it, it's uh, Olya Ol Olaker, um, who wrote just a fabulous uh, little book from um, uh, a report on the Soviet experience in Afghanistan um, and sort of the Soviet training experience for uh, the Afghan army. Um, and made the argument that, interestingly enough, well, I mean, it was curious from the first part because there was so much, again, that you could have just lifted out of Soviet frustration with um, the Afghan army they were trying to create that, that you could literally just drop into sort of American accounts of, of the same problems, just all sorts of cultural difficulties and so forth. Um, but she also made the argument that in the end, the Afghan army learned much better than the Russians had thought that they were possible, that was conceivable. Um, and that even though the Afghan state eventually fell after the Soviets um, Soviets uh, reduced, or basically after the Soviet Union ended, um, that uh, it held out for far longer than anyone gave it a right to expect, and that in, that in large part that was because of the training that had been imparted. Um, that it was it was a much better. Yeah, my, guess, my guess is his, yeah, history suggests in both Vietnam and the Soviet experience in Afghanistan that if we continue to fund the Afghan government uh, and its forces at a decent level, that they'll probably be able to hold out and the Taliban will be able to uh, overthrow them. Um, but, but how the conflict ends, yeah, there's got to be a, some sort of political resolution, and, and uh, we'll see if that's forthcoming or not. All right. All right. Um, well, uh, I think this has been a fabulous conversation. Is there anything else you wanted to add? or? No, I really appreciate you uh, having me on your blog. All right, well, and uh, look forward to another session at some point. Yeah, well, we'll 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 have to we'll have to do this again. I would I would love to at some point have Conrad Crane on here too. I haven't actually asked him, but um, I think he would be fantastic to come and have a good conversation with. So, um, yeah, he would actually. Anyway, well, uh, thanks very much, Pete, and uh, thanks viewers for watching, uh, and we'll have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. All right.